Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to the Geneva Association's webinar on gig economy platform work and the protection gaps that um, may arise from this um, phenomenon that is growing in importance. Well, my name is uh, Kai Wishans. I'm the Deputy Managing Director and Head of Research and Foresight at the Geneva Association. And I have the pleasure to serve as your moderator today. As we all know, the world of work is changing and an important uh, trend in this context is the emergence of um, the gig economy, which uh, offers uh, gig workers attractive opportunities, but also exposes them to um, additional risks, such as the lack of uh, sick leave um, uh, benefits. Now, with, this, with that in mind, uh, this webinar examines how um, insurance can and should innovate to better protect uh, gig workers. I'm excited to discuss this topic today with uh, three outstanding um, experts. Um, those of you who remember the invitation uh, will have expected uh, four experts, but unfortunately, uh, Stefano Bison, uh, Group Head of uh, Business Development and Innovation at Generali, um, um, uh, had to pull out just a few hours ago because he um, um, is unwell. Uh, so um, all the more, I take pleasure in introducing um, uh, our three um, expert speakers today, starting with uh, Vikas Charia. Vikas is uh, founder and CEO of uh, Indies, a European insurtech, which aims to bring missing protection and benefits to independent workers. And prior to setting up this company, to launching this company, Vikas was a um, managing director for digital partnerships and platforms at AXA. Uh, our second speaker is Anna de Montvert. He, she is uh, head of digital business development for the EMEA region at the uh, CHAP um, for uh, almost 10 years now with CHAP, I think. Uh, she started her career in insurance at AIG with a focus on credit life insurance. And last but not least, Curtis uh, Scott. Curtis is a vice president customer platform at uh, Lyft, where he leads the, um, the platform's uh, risk, safety, product operations and support teams. And prior to joining Lyft, he worked for Uber uh, in a number of roles amongst them as the head of global um, insurance. Now on the next slide, let me quickly introduce uh, today's agenda. Um, I will uh, conclude this introduction part with a few housekeeping announcements, uh, announcements and, and then uh, will offer an overview of the key findings of um, our gig economy uh, report. So the research report that uh, is the foundation for this, uh, for this uh, webinar. Anna will then um, uh, adopt an underwriting perspective and uh, share uh, the general experience from Europe and, um, and uh, other regions. Um, Vikas will then uh, investigate specifically the role of tech and innovation in closing gig economy protection gaps. And as we know, the role of technology um, in, in closing protection gaps is, is not only limited to the gig economy, but also plays a, a significant part in promoting inclusivity, financial inclusion more generally. And last but not least, um, uh, Curtis will offer a perspective uh, uh, from, from, from the United States. Uh, and uh, share um, his experience and his um, platform's experience with insurance-based benefits programs. This will be followed by um, a moderated uh, discussion, by discussion among uh, our experts. Um, and uh, of course, we will also make sure that sufficient time is left for um, your questions, for the questions from uh, our um, esteemed um, uh, uh, participants uh, um, uh, today. So let me um, just make it the, the usual, uh, the inevitable housekeeping announcements, probably uh, totally unnecessary as we are all familiar with, with the Zoom in the meantime. Uh, you should, um, you should uh, know that the session is being re recorded, so you will receive the recording um, uh, after 
after the completion of uh, this uh, webinar. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button, uh, type your question um, uh, during the webinar at any time, and I will collect those questions. Uh, the chat button should only be used if you need uh, technical um, uh, support. So with that, I can move to um, uh, the substance, uh, starting with a quick overview of the of the latest Geneva Association report on uh, gig economy work. Uh, we can move on. And uh, let me just start by elaborating a little, little bit on the relevance of this phenomenon. This phenomenon is on uh, everyone's uh, mind, uh, but it's actually hard to, relatively hard to quantify because uh, uh, reliable uh, labor statistics um, are in, in short supply. Uh, so we do have a few studies, academic studies, which give us an indication of um, the, uh, the, the relevance of this uh, phenomenon. And for example, uh, for the United States, uh, an estimated 3% of the, of the adult population um, is, is believed to draw uh, uh, the, the primary income from gig work. So the primary income, not supplementary income, but the primary source of income is uh, gig platform work. In the European Union, this share um, is smaller with, uh, with just 1.5% of the uh, adult uh, population. Um, it is estimated that these uh, platforms in both regions uh, generate a com combined revenue of about $50 billion in both Europe uh, uh, and the US. And if you apply an average commission rate maybe of 20%, this would leave um, a, a gig workers with income after commission of about $200 billion, uh, $200 billion which is um, a relatively small share of the combined GDP of the US and Europe, 0.5%. It's still a relatively small phenomenon, but as we all know, it's growing fast. Um, now, let me move to the next slide, please, um, uh, which, um, which uh, illustrates the, the, the notion of, um, of uh, uh, protection gaps. So the protection gap is basically, if you are hit by a calamity, if a gig worker is hit by a calamity, the difference between the resources that are needed, for example, the resources that are needed to uh, cover unexpected expenses, to cover foregone income, to cover continuing fixed costs, so on the one hand, and the available resources, which uh, might consist of savings or insurance coverage. Uh, the root causes, of these protection gaps are relatively well known. We, um, we are all aware that uh, many gig workers uh, uh, do not have um, uh, adequate and sufficient access to social security benefits. Um, uh, another major complication is the fact that they usually have low savings and draw irregular incomes, um, which creates a, a strong need for on-demand insurance coverage, which may not be that easily available. Um, and of course, the lack of portability, portability is a major, um, major um, factor um, that um, contributes to protection gaps. So the inability um, of gig workers to carry their benefits or their entitlements from one platform to the other or from, the, from a platform back to salaried work. For the purpose of the paper, um, which you of course find on our website, we have classified uh, um, uh, 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 these protection gaps in four classes. The, the most relevant one is income um, uh, risk or uh, risk to gig workers' income uh, as a result of sickness, for example. This is followed by, um, uh, by health exposure. Um, gig workers uh, are very much vulnerable to, to potentially catastrophic healthcare spending if they are, if they are hit by calamity. Uh, the third one is retirement, um, a very, very um, uh, acute issue uh, for gig workers, given the irregularity of their income. And last but not least, the assets. You know, the gig workers have to protect the, the, the assets based on which they offer their services. The next slide illustrates um, the, 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 the size of uh, such protection gaps. It's very, very difficult to quantify them. 
in a, in a, in a, in a meaningful and reliable way. So what you see here um, are the findings of a global survey that was commissioned or conducted by the International Labour Organization a few years ago, um, a global survey. And uh, this survey suggests that for disability and occupational health, protection gaps are actually most acute, with um, uh, less of 20% of those gig workers surveyed having access to such uh, benefits. The situation looks uh, better uh, as far as pensions and health uh, are concerned. And on the health uh, front, um, you know, the uh, at least 50%, uh, uh, a bit more than 50% of, uh, of uh, primary um, uh, gig workers do have access to, um, uh, to benefits. Now, on the next slide, so what? What, what can we, um, uh, what can we um, uh, uh, deduct or conclude as recommendations? Starting with um, with uh, policy um, uh, uh, makers, the first one is that um, uh, the paper suggests, that, and, and we believe at the Geneva Association that policy makers should remove disincentives to offering group benefits to um, gig workers. So, if platforms were to provide certain benefits, they um, they may be required to reclassify their workers as employees. And that obviously would entail uh, high costs, as platforms would be obliged to um, to provide workers with a whole spectrum of uh, of benefits. So similar to what traditional uh, employees are entitled to. And let's not forget that many platforms operate on uh, a, a thin uh, margins. So um, um, widespread efforts to 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 push for employee reclassification could jeopardize some of the business models um, and um, adversely affect um, um, job options for gig workers and, uh, and um, um, benefits also for, for customers, uh, for example. So policy holders have to really have to dread carefully here. The second recommendation is the encouragement of, uh, of portable uh, benefits. We believe that the workers uh, should be able to, uh, to carry benefits uh, from job to job without losing coverage, without having to sacrifice uh, a coverage. So policymakers could, could consider implementing um, a, a system of portable benefits that includes independent workers, and that would be particularly important for, uh, for retirement and uh, for health. And last but not least, um, um, uh, tax deductions, uh, especially for those workers with no or little platform contributions. This is a proven approach. We know this uh, has worked very well, um, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, in, in, in terms of incentivizing uh, retirement uh, um, uh, savings. Now, my final slide uh, 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 illustrates a few recommendations for Insurers, I will not um, uh, elaborate uh, uh, too thoroughly on that because uh, my, my expert fellow speakers can do this much more authoritatively. But what you see here is, you know, are the, 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 main, the main links of the insurance value chain uh, uh, and, and, you know, how it would need to be uh, adjusted and adapted to, to meet the needs of, uh, of gig workers starting with marketing, where, where it's about embedding the main functions of marketing into platform apps, then moving to product development, um, offering different forms of coverage, uh, pay-as-you-go based, uh, flexibly, uh, uh, coverage that can be flexibly switched on and off, for example. Uh, distribution, the next uh, element is of key importance. Here, the name of the game is, is minimizing cost through automation, through selling uh, uh, directly via the, via the, 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 the platforms, uh, moving to underwriting, with, with which uh, Anna will cover um, at more depth, uh, significant challenges on that front. On the other hand, also a big opportunity in terms of leveraging real-time data, smartphone-based real-time data, which is abundantly available, obviously. And last but not least, claims management, where uh, one of the challenges, where one of the challenges is, um, uh, you know, to straight through processing for at least uh, uh, basic uh, 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 claims. 
So um, with that, let me let me uh, conclude my um, my um, uh, summary. And um, it's now a great pleasure to hand over to um, uh, Vikas. Uh, sorry, first to to Anna, of course. <laughs> Who, um, who will share with us um, the general um, underwriting experience in the gig economy space from Europe and other, um, uh, other markets. Uh, Anna, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kai. And thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really happy to be able to join you uh, today in this really important topic. I hope to be able to contribute some, some food for thought uh, to, to the topic and, and give you a general impression of, of Chubb's uh, standing and experience with, with the sector. So of course, you know, Chubb is known as the, as the largest uh, privately, publicly traded um, property and casualty insurer in the world. Um, nevertheless, we do have a specialized section devoted to accident and health insurance where we cover people um, and, and not things. Um, so this is what we're talking about today. We're talking about it in evolution in the marketplace. Um, the gig space is relatively new for us. We've been underwriting this for about four years now across over uh, more than 20 countries um, and and of course what you mentioned is really important right it's the availability of data that is changing um, the way insurers can underwrite the space so as we as we try to evolve to to really meet the needs uh, the changing needs of our partners and of our insureds um, digital, digital digital capacities are a very key component to that so you know we have um, we're a company that, are, that has existed for over 100 years so we have a very deep and rich underwriting experience we have we are an underwriting company this is this is still key to what to what we do is underwrite assessing risk um, so it's now a question to see how much data and the, the quality and quantity of data that is now available and how that will inform and help us adapt our underwriting approach. When we think of the gig space, you know, the gig space can, can mean quite a lot of things. So in our experience, um, our experience is really focused uh, quite heavily on, on delivery service providers. So um, when you when, when you think of, you know, the Ubers or the Grabs of the world, um, really delivery services, um, which can, can can take the form of, you know, vehicle, four-wheel vehicle delivery services or two-wheel um, delivery services. And those in and of itself are, are quite different risks uh, for us because of the, of the accident statistics. Of course, you don't have the same kind of accident rates on, on a two-wheeler than you do on a, on a four-wheel uh, vehicle. And and, and of course, what informs the, the accident statistics and the under, underwriting considerations is the road safety um, and, and driving safety uh, protocols in place, how, how there's an enforcement of road safety procedures. And, and of course, this all impacts the accident rates. So we see quite a variety of different accident rates in, in the risks that we currently cover in the gig space. Um, but, you know, as we try to, so Chubb has, has been undergoing a transformation as well, right, as we become also very digitally savvy and digitally competent to, to inform not only our, our decisions, but also to offer, you know, products and services at the relevant time um, and place to our partners and insurers. Um, but the question I think with the gig space is, you know, um, what is what is really the role of digital capacity here? Um, I, I saw in your slides, uh, Kai, that, that you mentioned, you know, of course, API um, and voluntary is very important. Um, our position currently with the gig space is that, of course, that, that will play a role, that should play a role, that primarily we need to look at, as we've been discussing so far, you know, what, what are the gaps in cover, what, what, what are they missing today, and what is really the best way to make sure that these, that these products um, and coverages are offered. So we've been focusing on group insurance, right? And group insurance um, can take several forms. Some, some group insurance is structured in the, in the form of open group insurance, where actually the cost of, of the premium is passed directly onto, onto the insured person. But we're really speaking here about real or true group insurance, where the group itself takes care of that cost for, for its collaborators, employees, uh, whatever the status is, but the, you know, the people that are actually doing the work and then of the, on behalf of the company. Um, and, and why, right? So the gig, the gig space, again, varies widely, um, but in, this, in the parts of the gig space that we're um, underwriting currently, discretionary income is, is quite uh, meek, right? So we need to be careful to, to not overload um, those workers with extra expenses that they might not be able to, to make or, or be very quite unwilling to make because they are very sensitive to this lack of discretionary income. So we do think that the, the importance of group insurance is even more highlighted by, by, by that fact. 
um, and what we've seen, with what we've been witnessing in and uh, observing over the last uh, four years is that you know the companies are now really competing to offer a broader scope of coverages to the gig workers um, for a variety of reasons, right? Because I think there's a, there's a wide recognition that these covers um, are are very much deserved, um, and they're competing for workers, of course, and they're also competing for for retention. Um, so there's a um, a very high turnover in this space, um, and to to sort of mitigate that fact. Um, I think these, you know, these wider covers are, are very important. So I think that the key is going to be to find a mixture between what you want to offer as a group insurance policy, uh, you know, policy covering everybody, no matter um, irrespective of, of, you know, age and ir irrespective of any type of questionnaire, and then what kind of covers you really want to offer on a voluntary basis. Um, and as the gig space becomes more segmented, that will certainly become more relevant. Um, but right now with what uh, with what we're seeing in the market, it's, it's really group insurance that's, uh, that's predominantly the most important factor here. Um, and what we see, in the differences across countries that I can that, that I can mention so far are, um, you know, in, in addition to the differences in accidents, of course, low earning countries have um, have greater accident statistics. And um, so that's something that, of course, we need to take into account, but also the nature of the work itself in the sense that in lower um, earning countries, a uh, gig gig work is really the primary job. Um, and it is and it is uh, it is experienced as a primary job, whereas in, in this means in duration of, um, of how workers really stick to, to, to these gig work gig jobs. Whereas in Europe, um, we largely we largely see that it's a very transient phase, uh, typically with, with younger workers between the ages of 18 and 30, um, maybe two, two to three years max in each job, um, and, uh, and workers, you know, shifting between jobs quite easily and quite quickly. So there, there is uh, quite a different dynamic going on across, uh, across different countries, um, according to the earning profile of, of those countries, um, which, which makes it, you know, with, which speaks to the to the to the necessity of having really granular data. So data, of course, is key to 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 everything, um, and even more so now that, as you said uh, very correctly, Kai. So we have that availability now. So it's a, it's it's a question of working with digitally savvy partners who understand the importance of of having that data and using that data, so that we can get down to the granular granularity of understanding um, almost you know individual behavior, the frequency of routing, uh, what routes are taken, how often, at what time, you know, is it urban, rural? What does that difference make to 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 the risk, risk assessment? And the the finer, of course, we can make our risk risk assessment, the more true to that actual risk the premium will be, and it will be able to adapt according to to the behavior of, of certain groups. So that is that is important, um, and of course, the, the more we can adapt to that, then the more um, possible room there is in that in that premium to include other offers. So we have been seeing an expansion of um, of what we call let's say included or non non additional cost no additional cost programs as group insurance for these workers. Um, to you know, whereas before it was maybe just personal accident, and now we're seeing more covers such as you know paternity leave, maternity leave, sickness pay, um, and of course also this this loss of income in case of an accident, in case of a temporary disability to work. That that is also key to the consideration. Um, what we also saw, especially during um, or in, in this almost post-pandemic phase, I'm not quite sure we can really speak of post-pandemic quite just yet, um, is, is, you know, that we, we don't want to just be there in case something, um, in case an accident happens, but we take into account, you know, what's going on in the in the context of the, the current market and the current economy, and it, several companies have offered, um, you know, to have, to have a, a, let's say a COVID fund in case in case that is needed. So I think that's that's one of the most important developments that we've seen. And as companies try to you know to make sure that the workers understand you know they're important, they're, they they are being taken care of, and that there's a almost like a duty of care concept that is being um, um, taken now and, and and really assumed by companies for the gig worker space. Um, I think that that's. That the more we move forward, I think we're going to be seeing and hearing more about the duty of care concept ex expanding to the extending to the gig space. Um, other other things that we can that we can talk about is um, it is again you know it's, it's always a balance between the benefits that companies um, can afford to give and and and, and their earnings. Um, but we we do see that that come as companies compete more and more for for workers the the, the level of cover will certainly expand um, and we hope to to be able to to meet that challenge as as new risks are being assessed with increasing availability of data um, and to and to meet the demands of our of our partners um, and 
because of the digitization, we are also um, looking forward to, to maybe creating a space or creating opportunities to offer volunteer insurance when this becomes relevant, more relevant for the space as it becomes segmented more and more. But we definitely need to, to make sure that the risks that should apply to all are given through a group, a group uh, policy and discretionary spending then can, can apply to, to more individualized preferences um, and other kinds of risks and other kinds of products that really correspond to, to, to the individual to individual needs. I will stop there and pause any for questions if you have. <laughs> Excellent, and uh, I, I suggest we um, we uh, we uh, leave the questions for 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 later <laughs> on, and I'm sure we will come back to to many of the aspects that you that you raised. Um, may I now invite um, uh, Vikas to to share his perspective from uh, from an from an insurance uh, insurtech's uh, point of view and. Uh, you know, uh, slightly moving the, the, the discussion maybe on a slightly um, uh, uh, higher level, you know, the role of tech and innovation more generally um, uh, in, in closing protection gaps. So Vikas, please take the floor. Thank you, Kai, and thanks for the invitation. It's uh, great to be here with such great uh, panelists mm -hmm. and uh, at the Geneva Association again. Uh, we can move to the next slide. So I think uh, building on the points that Anna mentioned and Kai that you mentioned in your report earlier, I think we have to understand the context here when we are thinking about gig workers. I think we are using gig workers quite interchangeably in the industry, but let's broadly talk about platform workers, workers that are flocking to the platforms to find some kind of a employment, whether it's alternative or not, right? And as we think about uh, the platform workers or the gig workers, Today we see that they are at the they are at the short end of the stick. If we think about their regular uh, their counterparts, which are the fully employed people like you and me who have full time employment, etc. Uh, the in, there are significant protection gaps. I think I don't need to highlight on that. Uh, there was a report, uh, I think it was last year, which indicated that 80%, more than 80% of the people applying for mortgages in the UK market, for example, get rejected uh, platform workers. So if you think about the broader problem, the, the broader problem of financial exclusion or uh, is, is huge, whether it's on the financial services, protection, banking, et cetera, et cetera. There is a huge problem that is being faced by independent workers. And the number of independent workers are only increasing. We estimate, uh, and this is something uh, that the recent European Commission report basically indicated that but in just three years, the number of independent workers would grow from where it is uh, currently at about 30 million plus to about 43 million, right? So we are looking at a significant growth uh, year on year over the next three years. Uh, and I believe that uh, this will follow the trend in the US where more than 50% of the workforce today is already independent, right? These, they're independent, they are finding the work on platforms, et cetera. So we're seeing a very similar trend. One would believe that the platforms that are bringing these independent workers together have their life easy. And I think you gave a little bit of a flavor to that guy in your opening remarks. They do not have their life easy. There is a unfair public scrutiny uh, in terms of how these platforms are operating uh, and the big question for them today is what are the kind of protections we can provide? How? And can we get it at an affordable rate? You know, it's not that it's it's available to them, it's clear what's the right price, et cetera. So we are we are living through when we think about independent work. Uh, I think we are in the stone age, if I may use the in, in terms of our maturity, uh, in terms of understanding what are the needs, what should be the products, uh, uh, what is the right direction for us to address? And the key part where I think technology and innovation comes today is addressing the sustainability of platform work, sustainability of platform workers, gig workers. I think it's very, very important. So there are two aspects where we need to think about. It's empowering these platform workers for, by creating more financial inclusion, financial empowerment uh, to better serve these underserved segments of the society. Uh, and also enabling platforms uh, that are emerging today that are bringing together the platform work in various industries. So far, we think about platform work and we think about ride hailing, delivery. Today, we are talking of grocery delivery, et cetera. 
but we forget about the pink collar workers the brown collar workers in other segments that are today emerging and kind of transforming the the industries so i will broadly uh, uh, talk about four areas if you go to the next slide where i think tech and innovation today can play a role now by by all you know by no means this is a this is prescription and a in a in a complete prescription i'm sure there are wise men and women around who would kind of add a fifth bucket and a sixth bucket but the broad broadly the way i see it is uh, today we need to address the income protection gap you mentioned earlier this is something that we have been um, pioneering along with curtis uh, back when he was at his uber days uh, and income protection is a is a is a fundamental protection gap that needs to be addressed first before we ta start talking about any kind of benefits right uh, so how do you create a holistic range of benefits in this first bucket starting with income protection talking about financial empowerment how do you talk about efficiency and growth and things like health that you mentioned right in your opening remarks i would also say that the underlying concept that you spoke about in terms of portability is a very important one where technology has a great role to play so how do you make sure that workers not only carry their benefits across different job families in the same period of time but across a time period like over a period of 20 years they are able to carry their benefits like you and i do whether it be in terms of pension benefits savings and those kind of things this in my view kai is fundamental critical if we have to address sustainability of independent workforce in the european society very very critical right obviously there is a second aspect about creating an appealing user experience and i think technology has a great role to play to create products that are usage based uh, to create uh, hyper connectivity uh, to create embedded solutions and to create solutions that are api based and i think anna uh, referred to some of these comments in terms of what insurance companies are doing uh, it is very very important because insurance or financial products in general are not very well understood with the platform workers there is always a sense of uh, suspicion uh, there is always a sense of hesitation how do you get people in their 20s and 30s and 40s to start buying into um, uh, products that are around retirement savings and benefit right as a society uh, we have kind of moved away from some of those paradigms and people who find it difficult to put bread on the table fortnight to fortnight how could you talk to them about saving so i think there is an important aspect here in terms of user experience that ensures that financial products or protection products uh, are are coming into their daily life in an embedded manner uh, where it is it is not front and center but it is it is added to their main activity of work i think the third very important part uh, today that tech and innovation has to play is around furthering the concept of dynamic risk underwriting at an individual level we understand dynamic risk underwriting when you're buying your car insurance uh, usage based insurance but how do you actually adapt uh, what anna was talking about the underwriting paradigms around communities and the data of those communities and make sure that community as a whole benefits and the individual therefore benefits from that you know uh, collective risk models that you create around that community i think it's very important and i would here therefore put out this thing this concept of dynamic risk underwriting at a community level very very important for us to think about scale distribution i mean today these products again have to be provided in such a way where there are no hurdles there are zero touch point from a user perspective there is no hurdle for users to experience these products etc right so it's almost like a community based benefit that they are automatically enrolled in because they are part of a community i think it's very important again to think about uh, the protection against pandemic we saw at the start of the pandemic that many carriers were not able to protect or provide solutions for pandemic for independent workers there were many carriers that actually stepped away from being able to uh, provide this i think chub was one of the 
uh, one of the few insurance carriers that stepped forward in building a COVID protection product, for example, even with us. And I, I mean, hate to talk about Indies here, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a great example. Tech, the role of technology today also has to address the most urgent and pressing problems that are facing independent workers. And at the end of the day, these solutions have to be global, right? They cannot be local. They cannot be for a country. Otherwise, you're killing the innovation. You're killing the, the, the benefit that would actually go to, because it forces you to simplify the products, the benefits, so that it's easy to claim, easy to understand, et cetera. And I think the fourth aspect, which is a slightly long term, is around building a sustainable workforce, right? Curtis has been a big champion on these things. You have to build these products about uh, you in such a way where you are increasing trust within the community of workers, whether these are on-demand drivers, whether these are delivery people, how do they create, how does it create trust among themselves and with the platform, with the consumer, in, a, in such a way that you're able to align the interest, economic interest of the insurance carrier, of the platforms, and eventually the end beneficiaries, which are the workers in this case. So I'll pause there, Kai, and I'll return the mic back to you. Thank you so much, um, uh, Vikas. This was uh, this was very very in, in enlightening, and I think um, we will definitely come back to this um, this uh, pivotal role of technology in, in moving the concept forward. Um, may I now invite um, uh, Curtis to share a perspective. Uh, uh, from the US, from a major uh, US um, a platform, um, you know, on how he actually experienced the collaboration with insurers in terms of uh, launching insurance based um, benefits program. So, uh, Curtis, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I've had the privilege of working in uh, insurance in the gig space and probably about 80 some countries at this point. Um, obviously, mostly in the US these days, but uh, I think the panelists have already mentioned a few really interesting and spot on points. So I'll be a little duplicative, but let me kind of work through them. I think the first is if I go back to, you know, 2014, there wasn't a great sense of collaboration between the insurance industry and the gig economy. Um, and I think that's because insurance is an industry that's very beholden to tradition. Uh, and it, it's, it doesn't like when tradition gets disrupted. And so when we think when the, the gig space first came around, it kind of brought this disparity between the world of commercial and personal lines. And, uh, and, and it was funny when I used to go around to insurance companies, it, it was funny to me that sometimes the head of uh, personal insurance and the head of commercial insurance at various companies didn't even know each other. Um, and they, I think that's very different now. Um, and so I, I think, you know, we've gone from this, this place of uh, you kind of offend our tradition to let's innovate together, let's partner together. And, and I've seen that happen on a number of fronts. I, I think the first is, is data. Uh, and if you think of like the insurance world in the past, it was one of information assembly. The insurer had all the data or had access to it, or they priced it and they gave you a product. Um, it's different now with platforms. Uh, the platform actually has the data. The platform um, uh, curates that, has insights into it. Um, and, and speed isn't what it is the same anymore. We, we don't have 10 years for data patterns. We have, you know, a year or two, but we have very thick data. Uh, and so you've seen a lot of investment by gig platforms in, uh, in data collection curation. So we can use it to partner with insurers. Um, you know, both Uber and Lyft have very large actuarial science teams. Um, you know, I have uh, 15 on staff. Uh, I usually have two or three interns as well. Uh, so it's a, it's a formable, uh, you know, data facility, if you will. Uh, the people's skills are quite high. They often code in Python and R in addition to, to doing your, uh, your basic uh, modeling. And I think it's, uh, it's exciting. We've seen insurers really turn the corner from uh, at first saying, just give me stuff to saying, uh, show me what you have, I'll show you what I have, let's collaborate together uh, to get to a price that's right, uh, something that's, uh, that's fair, uh, something that works. I think the, you know, the next part of it, like the cost point out there is really the experience. You think about it when you go to 
if you're an employee and you go and select your benefits, generally someone has curated a site that kind of walks you through what you want to buy, how do you toggle it on and off, explains it. And independent workers don't have that uh, same kind of option. And so you've really seen, I think, kind of forward looking um you know, insurers and especially insure techs try to address that space, especially when you're in the A and H world. How can I protect uh, my income? What supplemental things do I need to buy? What's the value of it? Is it a good experience? People don't want to go see an agent these days, especially if they're working in the gig. They're probably working at night uh, or a day and it's not convenient. They want to buy digital. They want to have uh, a guided experience. They want to be informed on what they're getting. And I, and I think, uh, you know, doubling down on those kind of experiences and that curation is, is really important. Um, I think the the insurance industry, though, has also been inconsistent with uh, with gig. And, and I think, you know, there's lots of different gig types. So I would say that ride sharing um, is very far ahead, right? So when it first started, we we had a lot of um, well, the question, how do we have liability insurance taken care of? You know, auto insurance is one of the few things that's required almost everywhere in the world, except for I think like New Hampshire and Egypt are the two places I've found where it wasn't required. Um, and, and I think like, you know, everyone kind of flocked to that right away. But it's funny to me that for, um, you know, all the initial upper there and, and now it being solved and required and actually really high insurance standards in many places, uh, similar things have not happened in the delivery space. Uh, so in terms of like delivery of food, which we've all seen and probably used hundreds of times during the pandemic, um, it still shocks me that there's not an insurance requirement for the delivery of food specifically, um, you know, in the United States in the same way that there is for a, uh, you know, for an Uber or Lyft. And um, I, I'm perplexed at what the difference in the risk is of a car going down the road with a burrito or a car going down the road without a burrito in it uh, seemingly can do the same damage. So there's a little bit of inconsistency. Uh, at times in terms of where the industry puts its focus. But like I said, I, I, I'm really excited today in that I, I think you've seen one of more partnership happening, again, on the data front. Uh, but the other place is really, the, the, I think, the acceptance finally of embedded insurance. And I, I think, you know, when I first wanted to do this stuff a few years ago, it, it, it wasn't really like the term didn't really exist, but it felt natural of like, hey, we have this platform where lots of people are on every day interacting, um, you know, 10 times a day, 20 times a day, 30 times a day. It's a great place to buy the other things you need or to opt into things. Um, and at first, again, that was something very foreign to insurers, not wanting to have their storefront disrupted, not wanting to, to, to transact, if you will, on our platform wanting the, uh, again, the gig worker to come to their agent, come to their office, come to their site. And it's not really a natural um, a natural experience, if you will, again, for the gig worker. And, and that's changed dramatically in the last two years. And I think I'm really you know, excited for the industry in that regard, um, you know, excited to partner with them. And I think the, you know, the, the last thing then, like uh, on that kind of experience front that I, I'm still seeing, um, you know, insurers, catch up on and invest in is what happens after a claim. Um, right now, the uh, claims experience isn't great for gig workers uh, unless the platforms spend a lot of effort, which we do, uh, to create that digital first notice of loss experience. Uh, but even then, after we get them in the door, the insurer, are they doing, um, are they giving them, um, you know, a good experience, a white glove service, a quick claims experience? And I think personal lines uh claims orgs do a good job of that but often um gig work is brought in on the commercial side of most insurers and commercial claims is a completely different beast with a different trajectory and speed and tradition um and you know i, I just still see funny things where it's like and instead of helping this person you know get their life back together and the money that no one's arguing they deserve you know you're requiring them to sign forms and various magical colors of ink uh, just because that's a tradition not what the law says versus having something easy to digital sign or whatnot uh, so i think there's still little funny things to, to iron out but uh, again overall really good and i think uh you know the the insurers uh, can do more uh are doing more and i'm excited to see what else we can do i think we're we're still a ways away from getting the things like portability and whatnot because you're still eking out what are these products today? What are the portability requires there to be standards and everyone to use something similar to, to put it in in similar ways. And we're not quite there yet, but we're 
we're getting there and, and I think it's exciting time. So I'll, I'll leave it there in case there's questions later, but I, I think it really um, can't agree uh, with the panelists before me more, so. Thank you so much, uh, Curtis. Um, much food for thought, I would say, uh, for, for incumbent insurers. Um, before um, I, um, I, we will address uh, questions that we have received from, from the audience, and we have received a number of questions. Uh, uh, let, me, let me just uh, throw in a question that, that is, is probably one of the most uh, obvious ones. Uh, talking about the, the, the implications of the pandemic for gig economy work, for the model, for, 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 for this particular um, um, uh, element of the, of the future of work. I mean, there are, there are probably different uh, schools of thought. On the one hand, you can argue that this, 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 this crash course in digitalization um, will, will, will uh, translate into another major boost to the gig economy. On the other hand, you know, uh, also salaried work has evolved quite significantly over the past two years. Uh, with uh, hybrid models now becoming standard and you know some people arguing why should people give up uh, the, 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 the benefits and the security enjoyed through traditional salaried work uh, 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 you know uh, while, while they are being able to enjoy some of the benefits of flexibility that previously were were limited to the to the gig space so what what are your thoughts on this what is your uh, you, what, what do you think are, are the medium term uh, effects of the pandemic and based on what you believe, what are the, what are the uh, specific consequences for insurance in, in, in such a scenario? Who would like to tackle this question first? Maybe, maybe I start with uh, Curtis, you spoke last, <laughs> maybe you continue. Uh, what are your Just thoughts on, on the effects of the pandemic? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, the pandemic's been been difficult for lots of things. It's changed, um, you know, how people interact with society, right? So we saw, you know, ride share at first go down at Lyft, right? People were scared to go in, in cars and go places, but we saw other aspects of our business like bikes. Uh, we we're the largest uh, bike share operator uh, in North America by, by a long shot. And people started taking city bikes in New York City like crazy. Uh, obviously, we saw food delivery go up. I, I think with the interesting thing that just to say about it is the gig economy shifts with where the gigs are in a given time. So, you know, you saw people maybe do less ride share, more food delivery, uh, and now that's starting to shift back. So I, I think the, the flexibility of it can't be understated enough. People do the gig economy because they can get an opportunity when and where they want it uh, for as long as they need it and, and supplement their income. And I, I think it's uh, actually a credit to it, uh, that flexibility that you, you saw during the pandemic. Now, obviously, we'd all like to get back to our normal lives and, and be damned with COVID. It certainly hasn't been a fun experience by any means. It's been challenging, but I, I think you've seen uh, the importance of the gig economy, especially when um, unemployment was going up and uh, having quick access to earning opportunities is really important. Yeah. Probably another aspect um, is, you know, the, the differentiation between uh, uh, on-site work and, and online work. I think it's quite, uh, the, you know, the, the, the factors that are driving this are obviously, obviously quite, uh, quite um, uh, distinct. And we should not forget that I think according to some data I've seen for the European Union, uh, the vast majority of, of what they count as gig workers are um, uh, online uh, workers providing professional services. So it's not, uh, it's not, um, uh, it's not about uh, Uber and other uh, uh, on-site um, on uh, uh, models. But uh, Vikas and, and Anna, what, what, what is, what, if you against the crystal ball, what do you think, what will be the longer term uh, impact of this pandemic, if there's any? So I think the one very clear thing that we have seen in the European markets is, is an acceleration of a trend, which otherwise perhaps could have taken five, seven, eight, nine years, uh, which is around uh, more and more people turning to, towards platform for platform work and you know what we are calling as gig work, et cetera. Uh, but it has also accelerated the public debate around the conditions of these workers. And I think it's very important. When I say conditions about these workers, workers having basic protection, such as income protection. I mean, things what you and I uh, 
would take for granted things like being able to take a sick day being able to take a uh, you know vacation without having to lose their income today suddenly becomes very important for these workers and not just for these workers for a society as a whole because you're talking of a large part of your working population being vulnerable to these financial challenges so think about your first lockdown people not being able to go down go out salaries for people like you and me were flowing in not for these workers i think people were actually borrowing money people were trying to find other ways to to earn and i'm not just talking of the blue collar workers i'm also talking of white collar workers i mean people who are doing uh independent job as a art curator uh, in france for example for some of the leading museums these people were left out on their own to to fend for themselves two months of not having an income but having to pay your rental income you know people you know so i i think suddenly it has accelerated that debate around what are the kind of social protections we are talking about uh and brought in focus the comparison of we know employee benefits which we have spoken about for the last 80 90 years post uh, uh post the world war i think uh we have spoken a lot about it but i think we need to think about what is the new paradigm for this century when it comes to independent work i think they are the new middle class of this century and we need to address that in a very sustainable manner and i would you like to add to curtis and lucas statements yeah i think that the main points have been made and i can only um fully agree with what because just said i mean um it 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 is it is critical to take uh, to take you know the vulnerability into account and, and this will be definitely only an increasing trend so um the increasing trend for us um means you know continuing innovation in, in the types of protection and and how we offer that and how we make that accessible um and of course you know taking into account everything that's already been said about the journey being seamless and easy to understand and um getting that information out there so that people understand what their what their gaps in in coverage are and and what they can do about it um but i think you know as as the trend continues um i mean for from us of course the more data we can have and the more experience we have the, the better than we would be able to assess and 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 price the risk for our partners excellent so let's um uh, let's enter a few questions um that we received from the floor maybe the first one uh, for you um uh, because i think you you mentioned that um that um, effective products need to be uh the designed and 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 viewed from a global from a global point of view uh, on the other hand the reality of regulation is national um do you see uh, a conflict here and if yes um, how 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 could that be addressed this challenge well no straight forward answers i think it's a great question but again uh i think it has to be looked at it you know you know uh the the challenge that i was referring to is to make sure that the products are simplified we move away from the so called traditional paradigm of underwriting that curtis was talking about simplify these products in such a manner that you can actually make it understandable for the gig workers in a in a very simple layman's manner i mean insurers are notorious for the fine print that you would have the exclusions you would have but uh could you actually create for example uh, a protection benefit for sickness as a lump sum benefit based on certain one or two or three criteria right could you do some of those kind of things and i think th- this is where i'm saying uh the product benefits have to be simplified uh to the uh to the so that they can lend themselves for application across various markets now obviously products like health and motor uh will be uh, will uh, are regulated at a national level and i think they will be uh you know it has to be kind of rolled out country by country but when we think about some of the other kind of protections there is a lot of opportunity uh on the financial products that could be built and rolled out uh at a at a national level you know and uh, there are examples uh, that several insurance companies have done uh working with the likes of lift and uber uh similarly uh, you know there are there are examples that you could actually uh, put out in terms of understanding how do you 
uh, how do you build these products in such a way that you can launch, for example, pan-European product, right? Think about the social protection um, that today we understand, things like accident pay, sick pay, maternity, paternity benefits, uh, things like accident pay, et cetera. These products earlier, uh, back in 2015, 16, that Curtis was referring to, were not understood uh, that you could go, uh, that it could be rolled out at the pan-European level, right? They, they were being thought about, let's do something for France, let's do something for another market, another market, et cetera, uh, till uh, the innovation really came and we, we kind of really used technology and innovation to think about, hey, the business model could be tweaked in this way or that way that these products are provided today at a, at a regional level, at a pan-European level. And now, you know, representing a, a globally operating company, what, what's exactly. your take on that? So Thank you for feeding that question. Um, I, you know, you know I, th I think that there's definitely an advantage of being a, a multinational player in, in, in the fact that we can roll out in, in multinational programs um, and, and provide local expertise where and local local policies were needed to, to, to comply with the local regulations. At the same time, having having the, the global picture, um, you know, the, the, the global set of coverages that we want to roll out in different countries in, in mind and adapting, of course, to local regulations. But we are definitely capacitated to do that. Um, I would just like like to comment on 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 what um, Tavikas just just pointed out, and of course he he's right to say you know a lot of the benefits that we're seeing today, as I tried to mention before, were were not really being offered um, a few years ago. But now, as more platforms do compete for workers, we are seeing seeing you know parental leave policies in place, sick policies in place, at the group insurance um, place. So that this is, um, I, I think it's also important to to keep remembering you know that there's group insurance, there's volunteer insurance, digital of course has a critical role to play in volunteer insurance distribution to be sure that you're at the right place at the right time with the right kind of customer journey so that they can understand um, what they're getting and, and, and get it in a convenient way. Um, but there are certain coverages such as parental leave and sick leave and, and accident insurance that, that really makes sense to include at the, at the group level so that everyone is covered. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> another question I would like to, um, uh, to raise from, from the audience is, you know, uh, there is a there is a long record of insurance providing solutions for the, for traditional self-employed. Um, uh, to which extent, um, uh, you know, what's what's the fundamental difference between you know um, uh, in, in insuring traditional self-employed and insuring uh, a, a gig platform worker, and and maybe are there lessons you know from the past that could be. Could be um, could be drawn on to uh, to develop approaches to today's gig workers. Would like to start first, Anna. Okay. I mean, I, I, okay. Curtis, go, for it. go for it. Go for it. No, I, I I don't disagree with you. I mean, I, I sometimes uh, laugh a little bit that we act like this is all new, and we've we've had you know accountants and lawyers and doctors and lots of other people operating in this uh, for model for a long, long time. I think you know what's different is um, those professions tend to a have a lot of disposable income uh, to um, tend to really just be doing like one gig, uh, if you will, or one type of gig where I think what's a little bit different now is you have workers that are working on multiple platforms and they maybe do a ride or two or a shift, uh, or a minute, uh, and then go and get some others there. So they're stitching together the opportunities in lots of different ways, I, I think is what the technology has really enabled over the last uh, couple of years that, that that's different, but like conceptually, no, there's, uh, this has existed. Uh, it's existed for a long time. Uh, and, and I'm surprised that it's taken as long as it has actually to uh, service these gig workers' needs uh, on the insurer side. Because frankly, they're easier to reach because of platforms now than ever. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, it is the discretionary income that is available for 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 the insurance, um, which is why I keep insisting on, on group insurance uh, solutions being being definitely part of the solution here, um, and and the transient nature, right? So a lawyer will probably remain a lawyer for a very long time, um, and in in the gig space, we see people shifting, as Chris just said, uh, very rapidly. Um, you know, in the delivery service space, we see after two years that there's, there's an incredible amount of turnover. Um, so it's it, it it is a different beast. Um, it is a different beast, although independent work nonetheless. Great, excellent. Maybe because the next the question I could start addressing to you it's about the <clears throat> policy development um, <clears throat> and the reclassification issue. 
Um, especially in the European Union, we have seen, uh, we, we are witnessing some momentum with the draft directive that I think was, uh, was um, um, uh, published in, in December last, last year. How do you see um, the issue of reclassification? Um, do you think it would uh, do more good than harm or what is your take on that? Uh, so I think first I should uh, clarify the draft directive uh, I, uh, not clarify, I should kind of reinforce that very clearly in no uncertain terms, that the draft directive, uh, I believe, is a step in the right direction, right, uh, towards improving the working conditions of the workers. Uh, yes, there are a few things that the draft directive could have done more, uh, but as it comes to laying out clear conditions of what could cause uh, Reclassification, I think we are confusing that with the working condition and things like protection, etc. Uh, in fact, the uh, uh, at the press conference when the draft uh, directive was kind of shared, um, I believe the commission was specifically asked and they specifically clarified that the platforms making the effort to improve working conditions and protections at the workplace by providing insurance and other kind of benefits does not, and I repeat, does not automatically lead to reclassification. I think that was a very important clarification uh, that the European Commission report made. Um, it's, a, it's a baby step, as Italians say, piano, piano. It's a, it's a baby step we are taking uh, towards uh, achieving what would be the, uh, the new work order uh, of this century because it has to work both for the full employed and the independent workers. Uh, but I think it's in, the, it's, in the, it's in the very right direction. And you see member states today already going and making some of these kind of uh, policy uh, uh, policies around it to be much more specific. So I think from a platform workers perspective, it's a positive step. It's also a positive step from the platforms because so far, what we have seen over the last six, seven years, that the policy has normally lagged behind what the innovations that a lot of uh, uh, marketplaces, platforms have been bringing. But in this case, uh, some of the states today are already taking the step to clarify that, yes, these protections are important, they are necessary. What I see that leading to is that it will allow platforms to work together uh, in many cases, and we should see emergence of uh, at least a basic standard of what these protections are, so that whether you're a blue collar or a white collar worker, if you're going to a platform uh, and you're being aggregated to Curtis point earlier and Anna's point, I think you automatically get certain kind of protection benefits. It doesn't matter whether you are a, uh, a driver, whether you are a delivery guy, uh, whether you're working 20 hours versus you're working 40 or 45 hours, there has to be some kind of a base standard that we should see emerging out of the work that has today been laid out. Obviously, the commission's report will be reviewed. They will be put to vote. And then I think the final implementation will take time. But I see a lot of European countries are already taking the positive direction in that, uh, sorry, positive steps in that direction, uh, including France. Curtis, would you have something to add from a U.S. perspective on this reclassification debate? I mean, look, you've seen overwhelmingly when drivers uh, are polled that they want to be independent workers. They want the flexibility. They want to be their own boss. Uh, you know, there was many uh, polls taken during Proposition 22 um, in California, uh, and the majority of voters, in fact, you know, voted uh, to maintain that. So I think like classification is tricky. I think at the end of the day, what what gig workers want is both flexibility uh, plus some defined benefits. That way, there are not these huge financial outfalls. Uh, and, and I think you know, solutions like occupation accident, which is basically private market workers compensation is a great solution for that. And you can apportion it uh, based off of usage. And it's not impossible to do these things. And, uh, you know, Washington state just uh, passed, uh, you know, uh, within the last week, um, you know, a, uh, a similar model. Uh, so I think you're starting to see, you know, traction on that go forward. 
You know, I think it, it just depends on every country. Your classification is different. Some some countries have, uh, it's very binary. It's either you're an employee or you're not. Uh, some countries like the UK and Canada have a, like a third definition of a worker or a dependent contractor. Uh, and so the, the, out, the outcome there can be a little bit different. Uh, it, it, I think there's someone asked uh, in the Q&A, how do you figure this out? And, and so many countries and insurance is so local. And that's absolutely true. I, I think um, the same is said for gig work. I, I, the funniest thing when I first started working with Vicasa is there's a lot of more similarities between um, uh, large international insurance companies and, uh, and gig platforms. And there are differences, uh, you know, we both have, um, you know, a business that looks like it's just an insurance product or looks like it's just a ride, but it's actually a different business in every city and every state. And it requires a lot of people on the ground to localize that. Um, and that, that's true here. And I think, uh, it's a different puzzle to solve in every place as a result. Excellent. Before we wrap up, may I throw in another question, which was actually asked repeatedly uh, by our audience. Uh, again, we have spoken a lot about um, uh, delivery services, ride hailing services. I mean, how about professional services? What are the dynamics that you are seeing in this field? Uh, are there specific segments uh, where you could share some some experience, you know, from a, from a, from an underwriting or product development perspective. Uh, so, can we, you know, can we talk a little bit about those who still form the majority of what we call gig workers? Who has something to say on that? Mikas, would you like to go first? Sure. So, I I would not I would not know whether that's the majority of gig workers or not, but uh, I think uh, we do see an uh, increase in the number of staffing platforms that are growing today. Um, and these, plat these platforms are bringing together uh, workers, brown collar workers or white collar workers for different kind of jobs uh, where people can come in, put in their demand and these workers can, right? And not only are we seeing uh, high growth of these individual platforms, we are seeing that a lot of investors are also backing these platforms to disrupt the uh, labor market in Europe. So clearly pointing to the fact that uh, outside of what we spoke about, some of the, uh, there is a lot of movement and a lot of activity that we can witness, or we are witnessing today and will continue to witness uh, in the coming 24 months. Uh, and this is specifically around the broad bucket of staffing platforms I would see. Uh, the trends are quite consistent, whether we look at Central Europe, Western Europe, Southern Europe, or in Northern Europe, or for that matter, in the UK. Um, the protection needs uh, do vary a little bit, depending on depending on geographies, because in some countries, uh, some of these workers are covered, for example, with certain kind of health benefits. Uh, but there is a general need around understanding and covering the liability of workers uh, of the work and the platforms. I think that's an important one. And in some cases, uh, thinking about how do you create some kind of a income stability for these workers uh, uh, who are essentially could be part-time, could be full-time, but they are independent. So, you know, there is there are, there are these two things, but I would let Anna and Curtis comment on it. Perfect. Anna, anything to add from your perspective? <clears throat> before everyone says you're on mute, the famous tagline of last two years. Um, yes, of course, you know, and, and, I, and I think when, when we speak about that, this is the segmentation, right, that I was referring to before. Um, th this, is, this is a different kind of, of animal for us and, and such that you do have discretionary income. So this is where the, the voluntary distribution, the, the digital embedded uh, customer journey or insured journey in this case uh, becomes really important so that they, they have the right choice at the right moment, that it's relevant to their experience and that, you know, the, the more we understand, um, you know, their specific needs, because as, as Pika said, you know, they, they already might have some covers, they need some different covers, and, and you, you move away from, from a blanket group concept to really individual preferences and, and specific needs. Great. Um, so with that, um, I think we are approaching um, the end of this uh, this webinar. It was a fascinating discussion. I was I was tempted to um, to wrap this up myself, but I think it's much better and much more uh, attractive for the audience if I ask each of you 
to maybe spend one minute on uh, those things that you would like to uh, would you like people that you would like people to take away from uh, from this um, from this session uh, uh, Curtis uh, can I start with you one minute what should people remember from this session in your view I think it's just that, that uh, you know, look, gig work by its nature is flexible and dynamic. And that, that's what, you know, that's what gig workers want and need out of it. And I think that the way to underwrite it and, and bring value as an insurer to those is to really partner with platforms. I think, you know, together uh, we can get to the right data insights. Um, we can do a lot of things in terms of your distribution channel by bringing you direct opportunities to bring those products to market. And, uh, you know, together we're stronger uh, than we are apart. Great. Vikas, what's your take? One minute. <laughs> I think to complement what Curtis was saying, the question here is, uh, you know, the point that we all discussed today, the sen you know, the underlying aspect here is sustainability. Uh, today, uh, we have to address the financial well-being of gig workers, independent workers uh, in a sustainable way, because that is central for us to build more equal and sustainable society in Europe. Excellent. So Anna, the final word is with you. <laughs> <laughs> Curtis, give me a call about partnerships. We're all about partnerships, of course. Absolutely, that this is this is key. But I think um, my my one minute. It's the importance of data, right? So underwriting is, is is assessing risk. The more data you have, the more granularity you have in your understanding of what you're actually pricing and and the offer that you're actually making to that group to that person uh, becomes even more important. So the importance of data, understanding the risk that you're assessing. This is uh, this is no different for this segment. Perfect. Thank you so much. A big thank you to uh, to our experts. It was a, was a, it was a great pleasure uh, moderating this debate. I'm sure that uh, our audience has been have benefited a lot from your insight and ex experience. Um, before I conclude, I'm reminded uh, you see this here on the slide to um, to ask you to provide feedback. You know, feedback um, uh, on on how you perceive the session. This is obviously essential to us for continuous improvement. So we would be really um, um, grateful if you could uh, spend these few seconds sharing the, your views with us. Um, with that, um, uh, thank you again for your participation and uh, hope to see you again in the not too distant future. Bye-bye, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.